heute kommt diese Präsentation on diffused bills, actually diffused jam and diffused bills. So it's pretty late and yeah, hopefully it is pretty late as I get a lot of guys are still uh, in town and having dinner. But yeah, we're going to start there now. I actually had planned to give a short introduction about myself because it's the first time that I'm here at BoostCon and this is the first presentation. Yeah, I, I will do it anyway, so it's how many are we? Ten people. Okay, I will just give a short introduction uh, about yeah, who I am. So my name is Boris Schelling. I am German. I live in Amsterdam, which is in the Netherlands, which means I had a 17-hour trip to get here. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm glad that I'm here. So far I like it. Uh, I work for a company called Optivar. I mention the name because you see the logo here on every slide, and I will later explain why. Uh, Optivar is a market maker in Amsterdam, and unless you are in the finance industry, you probably don't know what a market maker is. But if I say um, high frequency trading, I guess it gives you an idea what a market maker does. About my uh, Boost background, I think I stumbled over the Boost libraries 10 years ago, so at least I could find some emails in the archives of the mailing lists from 2001. At that point, I yeah, mainly sent emails to the mailing list to ask some stupid questions how the Boost libraries are actually meant to be used. In the past years, I became a bit more active and also tried to contribute a little bit. In 2008, I wrote a book about the Boost libraries, which can be read online on my website. Of the book or the, of the website? Ah, okay, I can give you a link then when I'm done with my quick introduction. <laughs> uh, it's also available in English, um, among others, and uh, it will be also available as a print version, as a paper book from July on. So at the moment it is just to read on the internet, but yeah, if somebody wants to have a, a real book yeah, from July on, probably on Amazon. Uh, in the past year, I was a mentor for the Google Summer of Code program. So I also went to the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit in California, where I met Andrew. I don't know whether you know Andrew from the mailing list. He's the guy who organizes the Google Summer of Code program for Boost every year. I think, yeah, he's not here, but I guess maybe you see him one day at the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit. And yeah, this year it's for me the first time to be here, and this is now the first presentation for me. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I will just give you another link um, about the book. Ah, oh, no, yeah, here it is already. Ah, yeah, maybe I should go online first. The link is also available from your bio from the BoostCon website. Ah, yes, you're right. Yes. Okay, so there you go. Oh, well, you can find it on the. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Should hopefully work somehow. Yeah. Yeah, the topic of today's. Presentation is Boost Jam and Boost Boost. Before I start with the, intro, uh, with the presentation, I would like to know who of you has been trying to use Boost Build in the past or is doing it? I tried, tried. Okay. A few. And the second question is um, who of you was getting at least once very frustrated when you tried mm -hmm. to use Boost Build? Oh, yeah. yeah. Eventually, I, eventually, I was successful, but it took a while. Okay, so I can also easily raise my hand for both questions. So I really didn't know much about Boost Builds uh, until five months ago. And uh, when I started to work at the company at Optiver, I saw that everyone at Optiver is using Boost Build as their main build tool. And as these people at the company knew that I have a background in the Boost community, they always came to me asking me questions about Boost Build, but I didn't really knew that much either. And at that point, I thought it may be a good idea to create a presentation which was actually meant only for the developers at Optiver. And I had the same problem with everyone, where do you get the information from to find out how Boost Build actually works? And I contacted in December Vladimir Boost. Maybe you know him from the Boost mailing list. He's one of the main developers of Boost Build or maybe the main developer at the moment. And he knows of course Boost Build inside out. And I was asking him whether he can help me 
trying to understand how Boosbill works, and fortunately he did. So for about two months, we exchanged countless of emails. It took me about two months to understand how Boosbill works. And after two months, I yeah, thought, okay, maybe I can dare to give a presentation to colleagues at the company. And I think it was an also Vladimir's idea that because in May there's a BoostCon, I can actually give this presentation here too. That the reason why you see now everywhere um, uh, the company logo, why you see here copyright note, the company agreed that this presentation can be released to the public, that it can be downloaded. So if you like to, I also want to give you the link to this PDF file. So if you like to, you can just use this link and download the PDF file and you can uh, copy it and use it yourself. So there's just one copyright note, but apart from that, you're free to use the PDF file. All right, so the idea of this presentation is to make sure that uh, you all become Boost Build Masters. So whatever build tool you currently use, um, you should be able to get rid of it and use Boost Build if you like to. If you have been uh, trying to use Boost Build in the past and you were getting frustrated, hopefully all this frustration disappears now after this presentation. So this presentation should really give you the big picture and um, should make sure that you finally maybe understand what you need to do in order to manage your projects, in order to build your software the way you like to. And before we can talk about Boost Build, we have to talk about Boost Jam. Um, people sometimes get confused, or maybe you are confused. Why are there two names? Are these two different things, or is it the same thing? And I didn't have time now today to check the front page of the Boost Jam documentation, but I remember that at least once upon a time, the front page of the Boost uh, Gem documentation had a big warning, uh, something like, Dear Reader, you are probably looking for the documentation of Boost Builds. So obviously lots of people were getting confused and were not really sure what Boost Gem is and what Boost Build is, and that's the first thing we're going to look at. What is the difference of these two things, and why do we need to understand Boost Gem and Boost Build in order to know how this build tool works? So the, the easiest thing to understand the difference uh, between Boost Gem and Boost Build is we are actually looking at something like this, at a pyramid. Um, what I'm trying to explain here is that Boost Build depends on Boost Gem. If you like to, you could use Boost Gem without Boost Build, but you can never use Boost Build without Boost Gem. Boost Gem provides some things. What these things are, we're going to look at next, um, which are required by Boost Build. In theory, if you like to, yeah, you could try to manage some projects with Boost Gem only. I remember once having seen an email on the Boost mailing list that somebody wanted to do this just using Boost Gem. But I also remember that Vladimir pretty fast said, well, that's not supported. Boost Gem is really only, uh, has only been created uh, in order to make Boost Build possible. So there has never been the idea of uh, using Boost Gem only. Now, what are these two things actually? What is Boost Jam? What is Boost Build? If you look at Boost Jam, what do we find there? We find in Boost Jam a programming language. That's a programming language we use all the time when we uh, create configuration files to manage our projects. And this programming language is called BGEM. There's not only a programming language, there's also an interpreter which makes it possible to run our scripts, and that interpreter is an executable. You all know, if you ever installed the boost libraries, that executable is also called BGEM. So BoostGem itself is basically a programming language and an interpreter to run the scripts when we use that programming language. And BoostBuild is a kind of build framework implemented in this programming language uh, BGEM. So if you like to, you could compare it, for example, with Python. Um, the Python programming language and the Python interpreter would be here in Boost Gem. And the Python standard library, lots of functions we can use that would be something comparable to Boost Build. It's a very simple comparison, but yeah, in the beginning it's good enough. Yeah, Boost Gem, the executable BGEM, which we use all the time when we build projects, and Boost Build, a couple of so called gem files. Gem files are simple text files where we use the programming language BGEM. 
we call these configuration files gem files, and whose build yeah, consists of a couple of gem files where a lot of helpful functions are implemented, which we use when we manage our projects. Now, how does the project configuration look like? How does such a structure look like? What happens when we run BGEM? Okay, can I hope you read more or less? Now, here I have my executable BGEM, which I start. And what BGEM does first is it is looking for another file called boost minus build gem. And it is looking for this file in the current working directory. And if it doesn't find the file in the current working directory, it is looking up all parent directories. So somewhere BGEM expects a file called, uh, called boost minus build gem. This is a very simple file. In this file, there's actually only just one path embedded. And this path points to the build system, to who's built. So somewhere on your hard disk, you have a directory. There's my mouse. OK, my mouse is gone. Uh, somewhere on your directory, you have a, uh, somewhere on your hard disk, you have a directory like this one, where who's built is found, where all the gem files of who's built are located. And BGEM uses the boost build gem file to find out where this directory is. And then it loads all the gem files in boost build. And once the build system is loaded, it is looking next for, where is it? For optional configuration files. There are two. One is user config gem, which is uh, put in your home directory. And the other file is called site config gem, which is put on ETC on Linux. So there are two files where you can put in some settings for a user or for a whole system. If these files don't exist, it's no problem. If they exist, they are loaded next by BGEM. And once everything has been loaded, the gem files are loaded, which belong to the projects. So in this case, I have here just some gem files. These are the last files loaded. And at that point, everything is executed, what is found in these gem files, and uh, a project is built. So this is what happens when you uh, run BGEM. And if you get some strange error messages that uh, BGEM, for example, tells you it cannot find boost minus build gem, then you know you need to make sure that this file is either in the current working directory or in one of the parent directories. Now, when we put our gem files in different directories, how does now um, the entire project, the entire solution, look like, how do we build it? Now in this case, I have a directory called my project with two subdirectories, my lib and my exe. And the idea is that yeah, my lib is used to create a library and my exe is used to create a binary which uh, is linked with that library. And what we typically do, we put a gem file in each and every directory. So we have a gem file in my project, a gem file in my lib and a gem file in my exe. And these gem files really have to be called gem file, so you cannot use another name. If you like, you can use the extension .gem. If you don't like, you don't need to. And another thing which is important, in the root directory of your project, you put the file gem root gem. Why is this important? In each and every directory you have a gem file, you can run bgem in. So when you start bgem, BGEM is looking for a gem file in the directory BGEM is started in. So when you change to the directory mylib, for example, you can run BGEM in mylib, and BGEM understands that it should build a library, a library in mylib. But what BGEM also does, BGEM always looks up the parent directory to check whether there's another BGEM, uh, whether there's another gem file it should load. And if it finds another gem file in the parent directory, it loads the gem file and uses all the settings in the gem file. This gives you an opportunity to group settings which should be used for all the projects in the subdirectories. And in order to understand when it should stop looking up parent directories, it expects to find a gem file called gem root. Otherwise it would continue to look up each and every parent directory until it ends up here in C. So gem root is put into the root directory of your project and into each and other, into all the other um, subdirectories, you simply put 
well, normal jam files. So that text underneath, it says a jam file in a directory makes a directory a project. Should that say a jam root in a directory makes the directory a project? Uh, it is really each and every jam file. When I say jam file, I also mean jam root. Jam root is just a special name for a jam file, but there is really no difference. What you put in jam root and what you put in jam file is the same stuff. It just means that when bgem is started and it tries to look up parent directories, that when it finds jam root, it should stop looking up now further parent, parent directories. If it's not there, it'll just stop anyhow when it gets to the top. And could you give an error jam root? Yeah, yeah. Is it, or is it an error? As far as I know, it gives an error. Yeah, yeah. it says can't find jam root. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you have a project which consists of only one directory, you just need to use one gem file, which is called gem root. So you don't need to have another file called gem file. So it's maybe a bit confusing because I always say gem file. But yeah, most of the time we use files called gem file dot gem. And uh, the only exception is when you put a gem file into a root directory of a project, uh, then it's called gem root. So my live my live here could be a project. Yes, exactly. And if you want to, you can change to the directory mylib. You can run bgem. If bgem understands, it should only build the directory. Uh, it should only build the project in mylib. Uses only the gem file in the directory mylib. It also uses the gem file in the parent directory, and that's how bgem works. But it will not build the project in my exam. Which is why you can go into your boost tree, you know, cd2, libs, whatever your library name, slash test, and run, just run vgm there, and it runs the tests. Yes. So, in that scenario, if the test depended on the li li libs, would it not go build the libs? Or would it just... Yeah, we will see. There are, of course, dependencies. You can refer to another gem file in another directory from your gem file. It's also possible to put something into gem root that when you go to my project to this directory and that when you run bgem that also the subdirectories are actually built so not that you have to go to through all subdirectories by yourself so but this is something we will talk about when we come to this so this is just to give you, to give you an idea where you put gem files to organize your yeah project in this case, we really have three different projects. When I say you put a gem file into a directory, it's a project. So if you like, you can call this entire thing a solution. I think this is what Visual Studio calls it. I think this is something I just mentioned. Now, um, what can we put now, for example, into our user config gem file? Uh, I just mentioned that we have two configuration files. The one is used uh, for user settings, the other one for system settings, and here's an example for a user config gem file. Uh, we can put, for example, something like using GCC into the gem file, which means that when we run bgem, that bgem assumes that we want by default use the GCC compiler. And we can put in something else like option jobs and then this eight, uh, which again means that when we run bgem, uh, that bgem will start eight processes, uh, so it will run the compiler um, eight times in parallel to make sure that we can compile source code yeah, in parallel. These are just options if we know we need to use them often and we don't want to specify them on the command line all the time, we can just put them here into the user config file and it just works. Would it accept using Clang? Uh, yeah, in general, yes. This, again, this is something we are going to talk about when we get to boost builds. This should just give you an idea what you can put into this uh, user config file. Um, a question? There's, there are people been working on adding tool set support for Clang and so on. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. So there are different tool sets that you can use by um, using this. Well, it's not a keyword, but I'm going to explain later what it is. But I use this word using, and GCC is just one of the toolkits, and yeah, there are many others. Now, yeah, if you have this user config file, just put it into your home directory, and yeah, all the settings are always used when you run bgen. I've come across today um, 
a tool set specification which said GCC dash 4.2.1 or something. Mm -hmm. So if I work, for example, on a, on a new Ubuntu 11.04, which has GCC 4.5.2, mm -hmm. can I just say uh, using GCC dash 4.5.2, or could I say using GCC? Yeah. Does someone have to create a tool set specifically for this platform? Uh, normally not. So in this case, if you just use using, using GCC, it tries to take the default compiler. If you have a couple of different compiler versions installed, you can add here a version number. And it will, there are certain rules how it will try to find the binary. Um, but you can, I think, um, here with this tool set, even pass another parameter to make sure that it uses a binary in a certain directory where you know your compiler is located. Okay. So it doesn't hurt if I specify a version number? Doesn't hurt, no, no, it doesn't hurt. But you have to use, you can't just put a dash in the using. Yeah, it's, it's another parameter. It's, yeah. it's a separate parameter. Now, I said that Boost Gem is a programming language. If you want to understand what we can now put into these gem files, we have to look at least uh, quickly at the programming language. I guess most of us here in this room know what a programming language is, so I guess we can go quickly through the coming slides. And um, if you have been working with uh, gem files before, you have some problems, then I think it will help now to look at uh, the concepts of this programming language, because m some things might come as a surprise, and want to see them and want to understand them will be maybe obvious later, when you sometimes get a very strange error message. Um, so we will just go quickly through the things of uh, the programming language BGEM. So we are looking now at the variables first. And uh, the most important thing um, to know is that there's just one variable type in BGEM, and that is everything in a list of strings. So when you assign something to a variable like this, then in all three cases, x, y, and z, are lists of strings. And in the first case, you have a list uh, with one item with the number one. Again, one is a string. In the second case, you have again a list of strings with one item, that A, and Z is obviously a list of uh, four strings. And you see, you don't need to use quotes either. Um, you only use quotes if you have to add space somehow to a string. And you just need to write down something like here. You just need to use a space to separate the values, and then that way you get a list of four strings. It's the space between the literal and the semicolon important? Types. Yeah, it's very important. Otherwise, it would become part of the string if you see semicolon. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so it's a bit uh, strange for us C++ developers, but we have to use spaces everywhere. Also here around the equal sign, and uh, if you get it, yeah, you get an error message from BGM. Yeah. Now, if you create variables like this, and uh, you assign some values, and you want now to read a variable, you do it like this the dollar sign and the uh, round brackets. And uh, this echo thing here is a built-in function into uh, boost gem. So that way you can just print the value of set to the screen. And in this case, yeah, you see the, um, the four strings 2B, 3C uh, on your screen. What we also can do, we can append new items to that list of strings. So in this case, we don't have any more 2B, 3C in set, but yeah, additionally 4 and D. And uh, when we try to access um, a variable, we can even use an index to make sure we just take one item out of the strings. So the index is one based. In this case, I access uh, the string 2, the number 2, and print that one to the screen. And we can also use negative indexes. So minus one in this case is then here D. And we can also use ranges. So here I say everything from the second item from B up to the end of the list. Yes. So it seems to me that there's an ambiguity there then, that the uh, the second example you have there, wouldn't that be a range from the start of the list to the first item? Um, the minus one? One to one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that here uh, the last item in the list is printed. Um, yeah, I will I, need to check. I'm just wondering because if, yeah. if you said minus two, you know, we wouldn't. 
I, I would need to check maybe these open ranges are uh, only open at the end, okay. so I don't know really. I don't okay. know. Yeah. I just put it also here to make sure that when you see something like this in another gem file, mm -hmm. you have an idea where it comes from. So otherwise, yeah, it's, it's easy to create gem files. Nobody understands in the end. And uh, now we're looking at some things, um, yeah, which might come as a surprise. If you look at this here, you are trying to access the variable x with the three items, and there's a comma appended. There's no space between x and the comma. And probably in any other programming language, you would expect to see something like 1a, 2b, comma, but not here in, in Boost Jam. In Boost Jam, you get something like this 1, comma, a, comma, 2, comma, b, comma. So what we have here is we have on the left side a list with four items, we have on the right side a list with one item, and then the items in the two lists are multiplied with each other. That's how you can imagine what's going on here. <coughs> so, 1 and the comma, A and the comma, 2 and the comma, and B and the comma. And this is especially strange if you look at the next example with the X and the Y. In this case, I'm accessing a variable which isn't defined, which doesn't exist. So, Y is an empty list of strings. And if you multiply <coughs> something with four items with something which doesn't exist, you get nothing. So, in this case, there's nothing printed to the screen which is, of course, in the beginning very surprising. You would expect to see something, but in this case, yeah, nothing is printed. And the reason is that we always have this yeah, multiplication. We have always a list of items on the left and on the right side, and then we have a list where no item is inside. Yeah. If you multiply something with zero, we, we get zero. Now, this is actually the same thing as here. You can define a variable, and you can assign nothing to it, so in this case, you again don't see anything on the screen. So whether you try to access a variable which has been defined and it doesn't contain anything, or whether you try to access a variable which hasn't been defined at all, it's in the end the same thing. So BGM is not going to complain about this. Another thing to make your gem files more difficult to read for others is something like this. Um, yeah, it looks a bit strange. Uh, I think the boost gem documentation calls this one here a variable modifier. I think of it as a shorthand function call. So here the variable x is accessed, and then we have to put in column, and then we have different letters we can use here, and every letter is like a different function we call here. We can then, yeah, even use a parameter when we call this function. And in this case it means that I want to join the items in my list of strings, in my variable x, with a comma. So I want to use now 1, a, 2, and b, and I want to join these four items with a comma, and I get something like this, 1, comma, a, comma, 2, comma, b. So j specifically means join. Exactly. If you used a, then if a equals comma, it would not join. It would not join. Whether it works or not depends on the documentation. There are a couple of uh, shorthand modifiers defined by Boostgem. I uh, don't know them by heart either, so I would need to look up the documentation. I don't think A is legal. A is not legal? Okay, good. Then we would probably get an error. And yeah, I don't think that it makes sense to remember it. I mean, the year for join is easy to remember, but yeah, the other things. Yeah, I, I normally I try not to use them because if another developer looks at it, he will probably come to me and ask me what I try to do here. So yeah, these are variable modifier, so again, if you see it's somewhere in a gem file, don't be surprised, it's, it's just a shorthand function call. Now, as we have a programming language, we have also some things which we know from other programming languages. We have for loops, we have here a comparison with if, we have operators. It's, yeah, I mean, I don't think that I need to explain much about it. This is fortunately a bit more readable, and it's just the kind of flow control, a flow of control statements which we know from other programming languages. <coughs> now it gets more interesting because we can define something. Oh yes, sorry. Yes, yeah, here those are each strings that have one list of strings. Uh, yeah. I'm good. Okay. 
Perfect. Then let's go on to the functions. Um, we can also define functions in a boost gem, and we do this with the keyword rule. And this is how a function definition looks like uh, in this programming language. The rule defines a function. In this case, the function is called hello. Hello accepts uh, one parameter. And yeah, it's just a variable again. And we can then exit this variable with the syntax we know already and uh, print then something here with echo to the screen. Again, it's important to add everywhere these spaces. So you see around these round brackets again, between the round brackets and who, everywhere spaces. So I guess once you start working this gem file in the beginning, you forget to use the spaces here and there. But yeah, whose gem is kind enough to remind you. And uh, if you want to call now this function, you write something like this. Um, in this case, I call the function hello. Just write down the name. And I need to pass one argument. And yeah, in this case, I use a string world. It may be again strange that you see everywhere strings, and it's a bit confusing. What is now a variable? What is now a, a function? What is now just a, a literal? So here, hello is the function name. And world is just another um, yeah, list of strings, in this case, a list of strings with one item. And we pass world to who, and who is then used to print hello world to the screen. Yes. Is, it, is it important that hello is the first? Yes, is that, that is important okay. because the first word, that is the one where uh, BGM expects the function. So if you had like, a string list to add hello in it, it wouldn't start executing that as a function. Uh, what, what you can do is you can write hello, hello, mm -hmm. and the first thing is then the function name, and the second thing is just another string, a list of strings, the parameter. Yeah. This is how it's this programming language works. If you, if you, if you oh. wanted to say hello and pass the value of x, would you say dollar sign x in parentheses? Uh, or would you just put x? No, you have to put in a dollar sign. Because x again would just define a new list of strings with one item called x. Yeah. So whenever you just write down something, it's, it's just a string or a list of strings. If you want to pass something like this to hello, uh, you have to use quotes here because there are the spaces. So this is now one string, it's a list with one string. And yeah, in this case, world and moon is passed as a parameter to hello. If you like to, if, it, if you think it's more readable, you can actually use this quotes everywhere where you like. So you can put in, you can put here the quotes around words too. But yeah, most of the time you just don't do it because everything is a string by default. What you can also do when you define functions, you can add some funny characters behind the parameters to specify um, how many items in the list of strings are expected. If you have something like this, who, without anything else, it means that list of strings must contain one item and only one. If you use something like this, if you add the little star behind who, it means who can contain lists with arbitrary many items. So in this zero, case... Zero or more. Exactly, yes. So in this case, what you can do, you can call hello with world and moon. You don't need to use quotes, which means you define here a list of strings with three items. That is acceptable, because the function hello accepts there as a parameter a list with arbitrary many items. What you can also do, you can call hello without passing any parameter because the list yeah, may be empty. So if I did hello dollar $x, dollar $y, and dollar $z, do I get three lists concatenated into one list? As uh, opposed to a list of yes, lists? Yes, yes, yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't do a list of lists, because everything's yes. a list of strings. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone have an idea why I use this shorthand modifier there? This is because you didn't want to write a loop. Pardon? Because you didn't want to write a loop for that? Uh, yeah, you, you could use a loop, of course, too. I guess yes. Steve knows. It would be that you end up with a whole bunch of exclamation marks. Yes, yeah. exactly. exactly. In this case, I want to finish um, this hello world and moon thing 
with just one explanation mark, and, and there is no space between who and the explanation mark, we would have this multiplication again. And I don't want to add a space behind world and behind end and behind moon. I just want to add a space behind this entire thing. So what I'm going to do here, I join the three items with a space so that this whole thing is really printed like that to the screen. And then at the end, I add the explanation mark. If you omitted the asterisk, for example, would it just pick up the first one and choose world or would it give an error? Yeah, it's an error. Yes, it's an error. So you can use not only the asterisk, you can also use the plus sign and the question mark. Yeah, it's, I guess, if you know regular expressions, it's the same thing. What you can also do, you can, of course, add more parameters. In this case, hello um, wants two lists of strings. In both cases, the list must contain one item. And if I want to add more parameters, I need to separate them with a column. And if I want to call this function hello now, I need, of course, to pass two arguments. And again, I need to use the column to uh, separate them. So it's a very strange programming language, but yeah, this is how Boostgen works. And it gets now a bit stranger even. Um, we can define something in addition to the rule thing with the keyword actions. And now it gets really strange because if we call the rule thing hello and if we call the action thing hello, it's just one thing. And if we call now hello again, what's going to happen is first the rule thing is executed and afterwards the action thing. The only reason is because the rule thing is called hello and the action thing using the same name, also hello. So what's the difference between these two things? Here uh, in the rule, you use uh, the BGM programming language. So this echo thing, hello, who, and else, this is um, BGM code. And here, this action thing, you don't use uh, the BGM programming language. You use commands which are executed by the shell. Now what you have here, I think it is explained here, what you have here is called an updating rule. If you just have a rule and no actions, it's just a normal function. But if you have a rule and an actions and both use the same name, this thing here is called an updating rule. So what's going on here or what does it have actually to do with the build tool? When we are still on the lower level, we are still in boost gem, and later when we come to boost build, um, we will see how all of this is, is really used in gem files. But it gives us an understanding of what is happening here in the background. Um, what boost gem is trying to do here, that later when we want to build something, we need to run the compiler, for example. We want to start the compiler on the shell. This is typically done here in the action thing. But before we run the compiler, we want to check a couple of options. We want to see how <coughs> something is built. And this is typically done in the rule thing. <coughs> so we have here a two-step process, deep down in boost gem. And rule checks first what we want to build and how we want to build it. And the action thing is then used to actually build the project, to run the compiler, to run the linker, whatever executable needs to be run to do what we want. There's one thing which is important. This action thing here can only access the first two parameters. Here with hello, or uh, here with rule, you can add as many parameters as you want. You just need to add another column, and another column, and so on. Uh, with actions, you see here that we just set a name, but we don't set anything else. There, there, are, there are no arguments, there's nothing. So this action thing can only use the first two parameters and it is used, and it is doing this uh, with one and two. Now, if you have uh, something like this and you want to try it out, you can just put it into a gem file and run bgem and check what's going to happen. If you run this example, I was just jumping back again. If you run this example, 
uh, what you're going to see is then something like hello god and moon on the screen obviously if you run this here you would expect to see first hello uh, this case again hello god and moon with one explanation mark and as after rule actions are executed you would expect to see another one hello world and moon with two explanation marks in fact you can try this out with this um, command here and indeed you're going to see um, hello twice but you are going to see something additional you're going to see something like target world found in this case we're trying to uh, build a target world so you suddenly get some extra output we really don't know where it's coming from because you're not writing it to the screen but you see something like target world found, target world built so there's something else happening so we are now leaving a little bit the programming language only and we are making now steps toward the build tool because when boostgem or when bgem sees something like this it is not thinking about a function where we pass two uh, parameters to it is actually thinking about a target here and about a source here so there's a new concept now suddenly coming in and it is, it is looking at this and understands that we want to build a target world from the source moon so there we make the first steps toward the build tool this is not just a function anymore we call and yeah you can see this when you try it out yourself this first parameter world suddenly becomes a target and the second parameter here uh, becomes a list of sources which will later be used to build the target does this actually work since there's no target called moon that actually exists? Yes, yes. So, again, good question. Uh, normally what um, BGM does when it sees something like this, a source, it is trying to find a file on your hard disk which is called moon. So the sources are files and the file needs to be exist. And the important thing what you need to do if you really want to try this out with BGM, you need to use this uh, minus F option and then you need to refer to the gem file. In this case, I expect that all of this here is put into a file called gem root gem. And if you use this minus F, you skip all these basic rules BGEM normally executes, like trying to find whether really a source file moon exists. And that's the only way, as far as I know, um, you can make sure to really try this out. Okay, yeah. okay so I assume because there's no dependency added, it's not treating it as a file? Yeah. Um, in trying to search for it? Because that, that would still be executed, that step would still be executed by BGM. The depends or? The dependency tracing would still be run. Uh, I don't know really. Because that happens right before executing the build action. Ah, okay, okay. So I only know that when I use this minus F option that I can um, yeah, skip the built-in gem file into BGM where some basic rules are defined, like yeah. we are trying to check whether this source really exists as a file. Yeah. And is yeah, that's if scan based. Yes, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that's the way how you can really try this out. The important thing for you if you try this out is, yeah, you are not going to see only hello world and moon twice, you're going to see something extra, like target world found, target world put. Again, we can, if you like to, we can play around here with these funny characters, plus and the asterisk added. We can even use again here these uh, shorthand functions, um, even so we are in actions. So here this is the command which is run on the shell, but again we can use as much as we like to make it more difficult to read. And um, yeah, the last thing we should maybe look at, there are a couple of built-in functions into um, BGEM. Uh, yeah, just to go quickly through them. Echo we just have seen, we just print something to the screen. A uh, glob can be used to search for uh, yeah, certain files in the directory. You also see here how a nested function call looks like. You need to use these square brackets to make sure that BGM understands it should not just print glob to the screen. It should look at glob and understand that glob is a function name in order to do that, just add these square brackets. We have uh, built-in functions like match, 
which is uh, searching here for level expression in a list of strings. Uh, we have shell just to run some command uh, on the shell. Yeah, and we have a couple of built-in functions, and I think these are really the most important ones. We have actually some other categories, not just these utility functions which you have just seen. Uh, there are also some functions which belong to the category dependency building. Another category is modifying dependency trees. But if, if I start now to talk about these things, you're going to run out of this room in a second. So uh, you can really ignore these things. Uh, the utility functions are maybe in practice uh, most helpful. The other things, yeah, just, just ignore it. Ah, yeah, maybe one thing is also important to look at. Um, these are the so-called modules. And it is important because each and every gem file uh, is a module. And as the variables and functions are only accessible in a module, you need to understand how can you actually now call a function which is defined in another gem file, which is defined in another module. How can you ac actually access a variable which is defined in another uh, module, in another gem file? And here we're going to look at it now. You can actually create modules explicitly with the keyword module. Normally you don't do that, but if you have a big project with a couple of gem files, and you know now that each and every gem file is always a different module, you need to understand if you have to find something in the one gem file, how can you access this from the other gem file? So most of the time we are not using the keyword module, it's just that we have a couple of gem files and every gem file is a module by itself. And let's look first at how do we access functions to find in another module, to find in another gem file. Now here I have my module, which is called my module. It defines two functions with the keyword rule. The one uh, function bar is defined with the keyword local, which means that function bar is really only accessible in this module. The other function foo can be accessed from outside the module. Now the question is, how do I do that? And I can use another built-in function into BoostGem, which is called import module. I just pass the name of the module where I want to access the functions. And once I have written down import module in my module, I can access this module through its name. And I add this dot here, and then I just call the function name. I think this is something which is rather readable and I can even find out how many modules uh, how many functions I can access in a module by using another built-in function called root names and if I pass a module name to this uh, function it just returns a list of strings a list of function names which I could access in this module my module that's the way how you access how you call a function a different module now, you would actually hope that it is done similar for variables. But unfortunately, it is not. So in this case, I have another module, or yeah, module with the same name. I have a variable i set to foo, another variable j set to bar. j is a local variable. Again, it cannot be accessed from outside the module. But the variable i, I can access from outside the module. Unfortunately, I cannot use now um, the same technique as I just introduced. We have to do something else. And in fact, we are now using functions from Boost Build. And Boost Build provides a function called import. Now it's not written with capital letters, it's just here, yeah, this word. And we pass the name of the module if you want to import. No, that's wrong. We are, we are using import to uh, we're using import to load a module, which is called modules. Somewhere in boost build, there is a gem file called modules.gem. And we want to access functions in this gem file because these functions help us to access a variable in a different module. <coughs> the first thing we do, we load that module which is called modules. In that module modules, we find a function called poke and another one called peak. And these two functions we can use to access a variable in another module, to set a new value, or to read a value. It's a bit complicated, and especially you see here that BoostGem 
to a certain extent depends on Boost Build. There are, of course, other possibilities if you really like to use Boost Gem only to access variables in another module. But yeah, this is normally what you would do in your gem file if you try to access a variable to find in another gem file. Some tips and tricks. Um, I think it's rather late. Now the second part start. Do you want to make a quick break and drink something? I don't know how you feel. Do you want to as quickly as possible? As quickly as possible, okay. <laughs> Right, I have heard this more often before. Um, <laughs> now let's look at Boost Builds. I explained before that Boost Builds is a kind of yeah, standard library where we can access a couple of functions. We have seen already a few functions like using, import. These are all functions provided by Boost Builds. And Boost Builds gives us now a lot of predefined functions. And here we have a few more like lib, exe, install. And if you have looked at some gem files before, I think it is something um, you probably remember. These are functions you use to create a library, to create an executable, or to install, to copy files to a certain directory. And now as you know that these things are all predefined functions, you also know that it depends now on the function definition, how many parameters you need to pass and what these parameters actually mean. Now normally you would need to look up now the documentation for lib exit and install. But fortunately there is something in Boost Build which is called common signature. And if you learn this common signature, this is, a, this is a signature which you find most of the time when you call functions. Now this common signature looks like this. The first parameter is a target. So here who is a target for lib, bar is a target for exit, bar is a target for install. The second parameter are sources. You also see here that we can only pass a list with one item as a target. We can pass a list with as many sources as we like, but minimum one, plus means minimum one. Sources are files which should be used to build a target. We have a third parameter called requirements, which is optional. There's this asterisk. A fourth parameter called default build and that fifth parameter usage requirements. I think target and source are clear. Something has to be built from something else. Requirements, default build and usage requirements, we're going now to look at on the next slide. So what this, what do we have there at the third, fourth, fifth parameter? These things we have here, you see here in this example, are um, properties and properties are uh, feature value pairs. The thing here called link or include, this is a feature and you can set these features to values by simply appending another string. There is no space between the feature and the string. Yeah, and link include our features and the strings on the right are values to set the features. And the whole thing, the feature, and the value is called a property. And you can use these properties to define how something has to be built from the sources. You can think of these uh, properties as a kind of a cross tool set command line options. So when you define when you define a property like this, when you set a feature, this is somehow translated later into a command line option depending on the compiler you use. So what do I do here now? In the first case, I use the lib function to define a library. I want to create a library foo. The library foo has to be built from the source code foo cc. And I want to create a static library. And in order to do that, I use the feature link and set it to static. If I pass link static as the third parameter after the second column, then we have just seen it is a requirement. That means no matter what we do, this full library is always a static library. A requirement means there's no way for us to override it. It's always a static library. If you pass link static at the fourth parameter, then here behind the arrow there's another column, then link static is not a requirement, it's a default build, which means by default 
the library foo which is built here is static, but if we like to, we can override a default list. We can change that, we can explicitly say, no, we don't want to get a static library now, we want to get a shared library. That's the difference between requirement and default list. And the first parameter which we pass here, this include ink, is a usage requirement. And in order to explain this, I have to use two lines here, two targets. A usage requirement means that include ink is added as a requirement to another target which uses this target, which uses foo. That means here, my executable bar, which I want to create here, which depends on my source code bar cc, and which depends on the target foo, uses include ink as a requirement. As if I have added include ink as a requirement here to exit myself. The idea is, of course, that once I have defined the target foo, and I know that in order to use this library, uh, other projects need to find headers in that uh, directory ink. So this ink is not a keyword or anything else, it's just a directory where I expect um, that the header files of my library are found. Then other um, targets, like the executable bar I want to create, they will automatically find headers of my library foo in this include directory, because this include ink is added as a requirement to this line. A usage requirement is used by another target. I wonder whether it's too late for this kind of presentation. Now let's have a look at a couple of more functions. We have something like using GCC. Again, this using is not a keyword or anything else. It's just a function. It's just defined somewhere in boost build. And if you want to know what using really does, you can just look up the source code. But yeah, in this case, I explained it already before, using GCC is looking for a gem file called gcc.gem, somewhere in a gem file called gcc.gem in Boost Build, using, GC, using loads that gem file and call then a function called init in that gem file to initialize that toolkit. So this is something you typically use when you know you want to use, for example, GCC and GCC has to be initialized somehow. Boost Build provides a couple of tool sets and you can initialize these tool sets with that using function. That's just how using has been defined, so there's no, no magic. Yeah, we have seen lib and exit too. Lib is used to create a library and X is used to create a executable. We have something called searched lib Search lib is used when you have already a pre-built library. Let's say somebody else created a library called gtest, and it is somewhere on your hard disk, in the directory where the compiler will, or the linker will automatically find the library. So you don't want to build the library yourself. You don't have any source code. You just have a, a library somewhere on your hard disk. And you can tell who's built that when something else refers to gtest, like here, that executable, which depends on gtest, that uh, boost build doesn't wonder what gtest means. Uh, in the search lib, you can then say that gtest is a pre-built library, and the linker should automatically find it, because it is expected that uh, the library is in one of the system directories of, uh, yeah, in this case, of GCC. And last but not least, we have uh, uh, functions like stage and install, to, um, to, yeah, not to install files, but what these two functions do, they simply copy files. In this case, my X and my test, so here the executable, and what is, uh, see the other executable, these two executables are simply copied to a directory bin, and installed as the same thing. Here, my X is copied to a directory user local bin. So yeah, I was afraid somebody asked me this. I mean, I, I f if you like, I can explain it later, but I'm afraid you're going to fall asleep. I mean, there is a there's a tiny difference, but I think I will just continue now with the with the more basic stuff. I thought the two were exactly this, were just aliases for the same rule. 
yeah, there, there is a very, very tiny difference, and it took me quite some time to find it out. Really? But if you like, I can. I know there was a sep there's a separate stage dot install rule that yes. behaves very differently. Yeah, um, but if you like, I explain it afterwards. Yeah, I'm afraid that um, we are getting in, into so tiny details, so I think it's just too late for that. And yeah, I was already asked to hurry through the presentation. Now, if you are interested in the overview uh, of the functions, what what is there in Boost Build? What can you simply call? And what just works out of the box? Here are two links where you can find such an overview. And if you really want to look at the source code, here are the two directories where you find most of the predefined functions. Now let's quickly look at the features. You have seen already link. Link can be used to create a library. Uh, in this case, which should be a static library. And link is, of course, just one example for a feature. There are many other examples, there are many other features, and all these features have something in common. There are some features like link, which can be set only to a few values. If you use link, you have to set it either to static or to shared. There, there's no other value you can set link to. And we call such a feature like link, or I call it a, a non-free feature because you have only a limited set of values you can set link to. You have a couple of other uh, features which have other attributes, and define is a free feature, which means you can set define to any value you like, and that feature define is simply used um, yeah, to define kind of macro and uh, pass it uh, to the preprocessor. So the difference between Link and define is the other one is a non-free feature, and the other one is a free feature. And when you start working with features, you need to understand what kind of attributes these features have. Are they free, are they non-free, or are they, for example, propagated? Do they define a dependency? Are they composite features? There are a couple of attributes, and whenever you work with a feature, you should have an idea what kind of attributes these features have. Non-free and free is a thing easy to understand. Just have a quick look at the other one. Threading is a so-called propagating feature. In this case, I say I want to build an executable bar. It depends on my source code bar CC. It depends on a library foo. And I want to build a thread safe version of my executable. Now, if my executable should be thread safe, obviously my library should be thread safe too. I don't want to link my executable to a not thread safe library. And if I use now threading multi here with Excel, fortunately threading multi is automatically propagated to foo. So boost build makes sure that my executable is linked against a thread safe version of the library. I don't need to set multi -thread, uh, threading multi everywhere myself. That's what propagating means here. Then we have an um, attribute called dependency, and we have also a feature which is called dependency, and that's also something easy to understand. If, if for whatever reason we want to make sure that one target is built before the other, but there's no explicit dependency because bar here is not used in the sources, so it's not obvious for boost build why the one thing should be built before the other, we can just use the um, dependency feature make sure uh, boost build should build bar first and then bus. That's just the thing what the dependency feature is. And we have something called composite features. Here standard lib is a composite feature. And composite feature means it just consists of a couple of other features. If you use a composite feature like standard lib to choose a standard library, um, what happens is that standard lib is internally replaced with something like library and maybe some other features. So a composite feature is just a group of features, which is a bit easier to use because you just use one feature and not a couple of others. We have something like conditional properties. We can concatenate two properties with a column. When we do this, it is important that we don't add spaces around the column. <laughs> well, we, otherwise we have again different parameters which you try to pass to the function. And if you use something like this, it means if the target operating system is Windows 
then width 32 should be defined. That's a conditional property. What you also can do when you um, when you have here a <coughs> target at the source. So here we have the library foo, and we want to use foo to build our executable bar. And for whatever reason, you want to always link against the release version of the library foo. Then we can add here a slash, and we can use um, feature here. And uh, in this case, it, it means that foo is not always built as a release version. We can still build the library foo as a debug version. But when we build the executable bar, no matter whether it is a debug or release version of bar, that executable always links against um, a release version of foo. Yeah, these are some things you can use when you try to play around with these features. And again, if you want to see an overview of what kind of features exist, here are again two links, and most of the features are defined in tools built, tools built in Jam. We are, I don't think that we have already managed to look at two-thirds of the presentation. I don't know, if, if you like, we can stop now. Um, maybe we have another time tomorrow. I don't know how you feel if you're getting sleepy. You're already sleeping? I don't mind. I mean, I, I'm still awake. <laughs> Plow through. Pardon? Plow through. I can okay. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we will then look. We have something called uh, meta target. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately the most complicated part of the presentation, so uh, I'll try to make sure we go through it. We have here a gem file with three lines. And you see, we define uh, a library food twice. And the first two lines is different because we have uh, the first line threading single and the second threading multi. And we have another third line where we want to create an executable bar and it is linked against the library foo. Now, what we have here in this gem file, we have six meta targets. Why six? Okay, let's look at this. The whole thing, the whole gem file, defines a meta target. When you put a gem file into a directory, the directory is a project. And the gem file itself is a project. And project is the first meta target. If you have different lines here, like the ones with foo and bar, you have again meta targets. Foo is a main target and bar is a main target. So you have two more meta targets. Project is a meta target, and main targets are also meta targets. And if you have uh, no, and if you have main targets, you have for every main target at least one basic target. For bar, it is easy. You have one main target bar, and then there is nothing else called bar. That one main target bar has one basic target bar. For foo, it's a bit more complicated. We have one main target foo, even so we have two lines. But then one main target foo has two basic targets foo. And they differ because they have two different properties there. To make it a bit more understandable, this is how it looks like. The gem file is a project target. Then we have two main targets, bar and foo. Main target bar has one basic target bar and the um, main target foo has two basic targets foo because they have different properties. So altogether we have six meta targets. So what happens with these meta targets? When we run bgem, bgem is always looking at the properties of a meta target to find out whether the meta target should be built or not. So when you create a gem file, you define a couple of things with lib and x and whatever, it does not mean that everything is built in your gem file every time when you run bgem. What BoostBuild does, it looks at the properties you pass to bgem on the command line, and it looks at the properties of the targets, of the meta targets defining your gem file. It checks whether these properties match, and whether a certain meta target has to be built or not. So, in this case, I say I want to build 
a multi-threaded version of my libraries and executables. Now when I want to build a multi-threaded version, I don't need to create a single threaded library, of course. So here in this case, in the first line, I say this full library should be single threaded. When I want to build a multi-threaded version of everything, yeah, okay, that meta target still exists, but I don't care about it. So what happens is, um, boost build iterates over all these targets, it checks the properties I pass on the command line, and I say on the command line now, multi ready multi. It checks the properties of all the targets, and then it converts those meta targets which should be built to virtual targets. The other meta targets which should not be built, with those meta targets, it doesn't do anything. They are not used to generate a virtual target. Now we are still in the boost build layer, and we know now that boost build is based on boost gem, and if we have a virtual target, the last step is that we convert the virtual target to a low level boost gem target, and that is something boost gem knows, and then boost gem knows what to do, and then boost gem will make sure that those targets are really created. So it's a bit complicated. When we look at the gem file, we define meta targets, and they, these things are called meta targets because when we have a gem file with target, it doesn't mean that everything is built. It depends on the properties, whether meta targets generate virtual targets, and those virtual targets which have been generated, we are still in the boost build level, they are converted to lower level BGEM targets, and that is something boost gem can handle. I'm not sure that that's entirely a good description because when it's building, the way it works is the name refers to the main target and then it picks the best alternative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if you can always improve the presentation. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it's not too complicated but still covers enough detail so that people know what they can do with the gem files. And I, I've been looking most of the time at the Python port of um, who's built to understand what's going on. And yeah, if you want to look at it, there are a few lines of code which do exactly the things I was just trying to explain, where um, the meta targets are somehow used to generate the virtual targets and then the virtual targets to create the low-level medium targets. But yeah, it's not, not that important that we need to spend a lot of time there. Now why is it important to understand all about these targets? When we, uh, when we build something and we use Sources, then we have already seen in other examples, sources do not need to be only files, they can also be other targets. When I say other targets, I mean meta targets. So in this case, I say my executable bar depends on the target foo. What is foo? Foo is defined here. Foo is another main target here in my gem file that works out. I can also refer here in my list of sources to another directory assuming there's a gem file in the other directory. A gem file is a project target. Project target is also a meta target. So again, I can use another directory with a gem file as a source. And I can even refer to a main target in another project. So if I want to um, use a main target foobar which is defined in the gem file in the directory another lib. I simply use here the double slash. And to give you another example where um, you can see now that not each and every meta target is used to build something. As I said, it depends on the properties. There's a very simple property. If I use the feature build and set it to no, well, it simply means that this meta target foo won't be used to build something, so this meta target foo will not generate a virtual target. It doesn't make much sense, of course, to add something like this to the gem file. Maybe it makes a bit more sense to use a conditional property. In this case, build is set to know only when the target operating system is Linux. Yeah, the last part of this presentation is about generators. I will skip this now. If you like, you can just look at the um, PDF file and yeah, I'll, I will be still around 
until Faraday, and yeah, there are other people like Steve or Stephen who know also a lot about who's built. And yeah, that is, I think, the last part about the generators. And yeah, I think then we're done, and I let you free. <laughs> I think you're all tired now. <laughs>